Yes. Dr Perry, um, we started talking yesterday afternoon about product warnings, and that's the topic I want to pick up this morning. Okay. Um, we'll see shortly uh, how uh, the terms of the leaflet or insert were submitted with the license application to the licensing authority. Um, once the product license had been granted and presumably the form of wording approved, was there any system within PFC for reviewing what was said on the, the labels or the leaflets during um, the um, duration of the product license? Or, or was it a question of, well, it's been approved, we've got our product license, we'll look at it again when the license comes up for renewal? I, 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 I can't describe the, the details of a system, but, but certainly when significant changes to the product specification, and the best example of that is introduction of heat treatment um, was arrived at, then yes, the, the, the labelling and the, and the leaflet would, would have been reviewed. Um, in, in some cases, um, it, it remained unchanged, but in other cases, um, modifications would have been brought about, and I, I, I believe those modifications would have been notified to the licensing authority. So would it be, would it be right to understand and, and I appreciate I'm asking you about events, obviously, a, a, a number of years ago, but it, do you think it's more likely that there wasn't a, a, a systematic process for, for uh, re-examining the contents of the label, but an ad hoc process that, that as and when things came to PFC's attention or changes were made to, to the, 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 the product that... Um, the matter would be looked at? I don't think it... I, I, I wouldn't describe it as ad hoc. Um, but it was, it was clearly evident, certainly to myself and others, when significant changes had occurred to the product and, 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 if and, and, and some review of labelling. And, and, and the best, well, the first example we had of this was when we introduced the first generation heat treated Factor 8 product, where we really didn't have the opportunity because we wanted to do it so quickly um, to, to substantially change the. Um, um, the wording on the leaflets or the wordings on the label. And so what we used in that situation was we simply overstuck the, the packaging with um, notifications that this product had been heat treated and so on. And I, my recollection is that we, we advised the licensing authority that we'd done that. Um, now, I think you've said in, in one of your statements to the Penrose inquiry that the wording that was used in relation to hepatitis was the wording, um, uh, I think you used the word prescribed by the British Pharmacopoeia. Um, we, we, we'll look in a moment at the, both at the wording used and at the wording in the British Pharmacopoeia, but w was it your understanding that the Pharmacopoeia actually prescribed what had to be on the labels or that it laid down a minimum requirement or minimum recommendation? I, I, I'm, I'm not absolutely clear after the, the passage of time um, whether it, it was a requirement to um, slavishly adhere to, to the wording that the pharmacopoeia had used, but I think we, we took the view that we, uh, the product that we made was presented as um, human anti-hemophilic factor, BP, and which is typical of some pharmaceuticals, you put BPR, which, which means that, that it's been made in accordance with the specifications of the pharmacopoeia. So in that, in that circumstance, I think we, we, we fairly consistently applied the, the wording that had been um, um, prescribed by the pharmacopoeia. I think there was, a, there was freedom for manufacturers to, 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 to d diverge from that. Um, but it's always a problem with, with small vials of product, how much wording you can actually put on a label or in a product insert leaflet. So. Um, I'm going to ask you to look at um, the leaflets uh, and, and some of the information <coughs> excuse me, submitted uh, to the licensing authority and also some of the labels. We did look at these with Dr Foster, but I'm conscious that there may be those listening who, who um, wouldn't have seen this material, so I'm going to take a little time going to it again, uh, Dr Perry. If we start at PRSE 0002726... Um, and if we go over the, um, to 
to page five, I think, Sally. No, I had this last time. Try page 10. I think there are blank pages in the middle. Thank you. So this is um, the licence application uh, um, submitted by Mr Watt in March 1978 for PFC's Factor 8 product. Is that right? Yes, yes. Um, and if we go to the second page... And we look at the bottom half of the page. There's the head, sorry, just up a little further, please. So we've got the um, contraindications, precautions and warnings. Uh, we it say it's written, no contraindications. Warnings include storage below five degrees centigrade, reconstitution by addition of pyrogen-free distilled water. Uh, materials should not be infused if a gel forms on solution should be discarded if not used within three hours of preparation of solution. And then this product may carry the risk of transmitting serum hepatitis. So that's the information in the application form. If we go over to the next page, please, Sully, or if it's blank, go two pages. Yeah, thank you. So we can see um, this is then, as I understand it, appended to the licence application form, and it's PFC's proposed draft package leaflet insert, is that right? For the 1978 For the 1978 application, application yeah. And then if we go on um, to the next page, please, we can see in the second paragraph, in, in, as part of the description, it refers to all plasma used for the preparation of factor eight concentrators derived from blood collected from volunteer donors, has been screened for the presence of the HB surface antigen and details given of the test. Um, Preparation's also been examined by more searching techniques applied in at least two laboratories external to the laboratory of manufacture. Do you know what that's a reference to? Um, no, but there, there would have been um, reference laboratories in both Scotland and, and, and England that had perhaps more sensitive assays available. And, uh, and uh, my predecessor, Mr. Watt, I think, always took the advantage of, of accessing those to... Um, either to uh, um, confirm the results that PFC was getting or, or he was interested in, 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 a, in a technique which could be more searching. I don't think they were routinely applied to every batch. And then it continues... Just, just one minute. Um, do you actually know of a test being used in 1978 which was more searching than radio immunoassay? I can understand that... Uh, RIA is, is and was thought to be at the time more searching than RPH. Mm. But RIA itself, more but, searching than that? Well, there, 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 may, there may have been versions of it, um, different extraction techniques, which increased the sensitivity. I think it's, I think it's simply implying that. I don't, I don't think that there was nothing like um, nucleic acid amplification technology then. No. Um, so it was a... I, my understanding is that this would have been a... Um, a more, perhaps a more sensitive assay using more sophisticated extraction techniques for the product, um, which, which may, have, may have picked up or had the capability of picking up much lower levels of contamination that, that, that could be detected by a routine assay. That's, that's my understanding, although I don't have a, a, a clear view on it, and I'm not sure what Mr. Watt meant in 1978, but that's my interpretation of his meaning. Thank you. Uh, and then the, the um, leaflet continues, none, nevertheless, none of these tests are of sufficient sensitivity to eliminate the possibility of transmitting hepatitis. Methods for examination of the product continue to be developed, but the risk of transmission cannot be disregarded. Um, um, so that's part of the description. And then over the page, under the heading mm. side effects, to, towards the bottom of the page, complications in the use of factor eight concentrate are rare, Apart from the general complications of hepatitis and intravascular hemolysis, see above, some patients may occasionally experience slight irritation at the site of injection, and then there's reference to transitory headache or nausea being reported. Um, uh, so that, that's the, the information as at 1978. If we then go over the page to the application made also in 78, but I think in October 78 for factor nine, can we go to the next page, please, Sally? Um, we can see again, bottom of the page, we see in the licence application form um, a similar heading, contraindications, precautions and warnings. 
uh, uh, um, similar to, to, to the what said in relation to factor eight, and then product may carry the risk of transmitting serum hepatitis, and then there's reference to a slight generic risk of diffuse intravascular thrombosis. Um, and then if we go to the next page, we can see we've got, similarly, we've got an appendix containing the proposed package leaflet insert for the defix, the factor nine concentrate. If we go to the next page, um, I won't read it fully aloud, but we've got in the second paragraph under the heading description, um, a, a similar uh, 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 um, explanation um, uh, uh, recording in the penultimate sentence, none of these tests are of sufficient sensitivity to eliminate the possibility of transmitting hepatitis. The risk of transmission cannot be disregarded. And then if we go over the page to side effects, um, it, it suggests complications in, in the use of the factor nine concentrate defix are rare. And then there's the reference to the general complications of hepatitis. Um, and, and then it goes on to talk about uh, um, intravascular coagulation or thrombosis um, as a uh, potential side effect of factor nine. Um, can we go to the next page then, please? Um, if we zoom in on this, um, is this, as far as you understand it, the final version of the leaflet, Dr. Perry? Um, um, unfortunately, it hasn't got a date reference, um, but it's... It's, it's, prior, it's a leaflet that was used prior to the introduction of heat treatment. So I believe this is a, a, a faithful copy of the leaflet which was included with the product. Um, and, and so this is factor eight, um, and we can see um, in the second paragraph under the heading description, um, I haven't checked word for word to see if it's identical to the form submitted to the licensing authority, but it certainly seems to be um, largely the same in relation to what's said about hepatitis. Um, and under the heading side effects, again, it seems to follow um, uh, or be very similar to the language in the draft submitted to the licensing authority. So reference there, do you see, to the general complications of hepatitis. And then next page. Um, we have, as I understand it now, the leaflet in relation to factor eight heat treated. Is that right? Yes. Um, what, um, would this then be a leaflet that would have been produced from, uh, well, are you able to assist us with when? Or is a date in the bottom right, which looks like it's April 1985, yes, 585? I, th I think that is a date reference for this particular leaflet. Do, do you know what was done between December 1984 and April 1985 in terms of information provided with the heat-treated product? I'm, 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 I'm not sure what information was provided um, in, addition to, in addition to the leaflet. Um, as, I, as I mentioned um, a, a few minutes ago, uh, the action that we took as a, res as a result of introducing our first-generation heat-treated product was simply to pl apply overstick labels to the existing labeling. That was seen as the most efficient and, uh, and, 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 and quick way of, of getting the product to issue. Well, in any event, so by April 1985, we've got this as the leaflet yes. for the heat-treated factor eight. Yes. We can see the second paragraph um, refers, under, sorry, under the heading description, refers to a collection from volunteer donors, screening for hepatitis B surface antigen using radioimmunoassay, so just the RIA test, mm -hmm. reference again to the more sensitive techniques. Um, uh, and then the product has been heat treated at 68 degrees centigrade for 24 hours in the dried state, but it cannot be assumed that the product is non-infective. Um, there's not, I, I, I think this is right, in this section, any express reference to 
um, serum hepatitis or, or hepatitis beyond the he hepatitis B surface antigen testing? Um, uh, no, there is no explicit, explicit reference to any particular um, infectivity risk. Um, and my recollection is that I think in discussions with um, Professor Cash and probably the Haemophilia Center directors as well, we, we chose to give a more generic um, expression of non-infective, which was intended to, um, to, to imply that, that there could be a risk of other viruses as well. So I think we, 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 we moved from a situation where we were only referencing hepatitis and, and, and this was intended to include, particularly at this time, HIV as well. Uh, but the, there's, I think it's, it's clear on the face that there's no express reference to HTLV3 or, or AIDS. No, no. Um, no. I, um, think, I think that was by design at that stage. Yes, um, and I'll, I'll, I'll come back to in, sure. in, in a, once we've looked at the actual documents as to, as to why that might be the case. Um, there is reference under the heading side effects to general complications of hepatitis. Um, uh, and we can see that in the uh, um, second sentence there. Uh, and then if we go to the next uh, page... May I just ask, the, the references uh, here, uh, the references one and two at the bottom, uh, they are co copied over from the previous document. I think reference number three, MMWR, volume 33, number 42, 1984, is a new one. Uh, and if I'm... Mm. Yes. Uh, I imagine, but I haven't checked, that... Uh, maybe the MMWR that spoke about the likely efficacy of heat treatment. The timing would be right, but I haven't checked either, but so I'll do checked. so. But that could be checked it, and it, confirmed it, in due course. The timing is certainly consistent, I agree. Yes. Um, and then if we go to the next page, um, we've got what looks like to, uh, the issued leaflet in relation to the unheated factor 9 concentrate. Yes. Yes. Um, and the description contains, uh, uh, in the second paragraph, a, a similar narrative to that in the uh, draft leaflet submitted in 1978 with the licence application. And then if we look at side effects, there's reference there in the uh, second sentence, again, to general complications of hepatitis. Um, and then the next page is um, the heat-treated factor 9... Now, if we just look a little more closely, first of all, uh, to the left-hand side, please, Sully. Thank you. Um, so if we look at the second paragraph under the heading description, it re reads, all plasma used for the preparation of factor nine concentrators derived from blood collected by volunteer donors has been screened for the presence of the hepatitis B surface antigen using a radioimmunoassay. The preparation has also been examined for this antigen by more searching techniques applied in at least two laboratories. So that's similar to what had been in the earlier leaflets since 1978. Yes, yes. In addition, uh, product plasma pools and individual plasma donations are tested for the presence of antibody to HTLV3. The product has been heat treated at 80 degrees centigrade for 72 hours in the freeze-dried state. This treatment is expected to inactivate viruses associated with the acquired immune deficiency syndrome, HTLV3, LAV, ARV, the effect of this heat treatment on hepatitis B and hepatitis non-A, non-B has still to be elucidated, and therefore this product cannot be assumed to be non-infective with regard to the hepatitis viruses. Um, um, and then if we, before I ask you about that, if we just look at side effects, we can see it records, apart from the general complications of virus transmission discussed above, and then it goes on to talk about the risks of intravascular coagulation um, or, or, or thrombosis. Um, now, I don't think this leaflet is dated. Can we just go back to the whole leaflet, Sally? We don't appear to have a, um, a date on it in the way that we had for the heat-treated factor eight. Um, but does the reference to uh, um, plasma pools and individual plasma donations being tested and the reference to the heat treatment programme enable you to tell us roughly when this would have been produced? Yes, um, they, uh, I, I, we may come on to, to discuss this, but the Factor 9 product um, was not introduced. The heat treated factor, heat treated defix was not introduced for routine use in, 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 in Scotland until um, the autumn of, of 1985. 
um, because of our experiments and studies um, um, to ensure that it didn't have any um, um, risk of, of thrombosis associated with it. Um, uh, so by that time, we knew we were testing we, well, we were. We were testing individual donations and plasma pools for, for HIV. Which was, a, I think, middle of October 1985. Which was middle so of October is, 1985, This is autumn yes. or end of 1985, this leaflet. So, so the opportunity presented itself to update that leaflet, and uh, that opportunity didn't exist with Factor 8, which was introduced in um, the 24-hour heat, heated product wasn't introduced. It was introduced much sooner than that um, in manufacture at the, uh, in, in early 1985, and, and HIV testing hadn't been introduced then. And then if we just go to the next page, I'm not going to try and read this because um, we looked at it with Dr. Foster, and he helpfully reminded us that there were colour copies available, which are easier to read. So if we, um, we can see these are, these are vile labels. Yes. If we go to CBCA5065 underscore 010, I hope we will have a clearer... So this is slightly easier to read. So if we um, look first of all at the uh, top label, which is unheated factor 8, I don't think, again, we have a... Date. Um, there's an expiry for this particular vial, presumably, this particular batch, um, which looks like it, well, I'm not quite sure, 84? It looks like 1284. I'm, I'm sorry, where were we? So the expiry date in the bottom right-hand corner of that label. A SLC, was it 2575M slash 12, 12 slash 84? So it looks like... 1284, it looks as though there might be the operative it, date. It, yes, it it, it, it it seems a strange way of expressing the expiry date, which is usually just a, 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 a um, so I, I can't quite explain that, but it, it could well have been a, a, a sample label from a batch which did expire in, 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 in December 1984. Well, whoever was using it would have to know when it was past its use. Yes, date, absolutely, right? absolutely. Um, in, in any event, we're told, um, and I think it's apparent on, from the leaflet that it's, uh, sorry, from the label, that this is for factor eight, and, and it's clear it's for the non-heat treated factor eight, so it's for the product that was being used by PFC up until the end of 1984. Yes. Um, uh, and we can see the label um, contains instructions uh, about um, reconstitution uh, and so on. Um, and then says, this preparation is of human origin and cannot be assumed free of hepatitis virus. That's... Um, um, and that, that is what I think we'll see is um, uh, uh, potentially echoes the language of the British Pharmacopoeia. Um, if we then just go to the, n the next label, so this is the um, heat-treated factor eight, and um, again, looking at the expiry date looks to me as though it's a date in 1985. Yes. It looks like um, 285. Yes, it's February 85, yeah. Um, and again, the, the label uh, has uh, uh, um, instructions in relation to reconstitution, and then the last sentence says, the freeze-dried product has been heat-treated but cannot be assumed to be non-infective. So that echoes... I think the term that PFC have chosen to use in the leaflet, not referencing hepatitis, not referencing um, uh, AIDS or HTLV3, yes, but, but using the terminology non-infective. But, but recognising there were risks other than hepatitis by then. Um, I, I, I think this, this, this curious um, uh, reference in the, in the expiry date actually um, is, is just a, a, a label dating reference for when the label was drafted, I think typically um, it, under the, the factor eight, the lot number and expires, there would have been a much clearer yes, yes. expression alongside. These are blank labels. So I, I, I think that reference down there, which is a bit curious, is a, is a, is a label version reference. Thank you. That, uh, understood. And then if we look at the last of the um, labels, uh, which is for the unheated factor nine concentrate, 
um, we can see, again, it, can, it has uh, um, instructions in relation to uh, uh, usage, and then it says this preparation is of human origin and cannot be assumed free of hepatitis virus. Um, so uh, uh, I think we can see from um, uh, the material that we've looked at, um, Dr. Perry, there's no express reference to non-A, non-B hepatitis in, in any of the material until we get to the uh, heated factor nine okay. at the end of 1985. Yes, that's right, yes. Um, there's no particular description or account of either the, the, of the seriousness of, of hepatitis, is there? Um, no, there's not. No, no, I, um. Um, there's no reference to HTLV3 or AIDS again until we get to the, uh, the heat-treated factor 9 towards the end of 1985. Yes, but not an explicit reference to it. Is in, uh, only in on the, the factor 9 there's an explicit reference okay. to acquired immune deficiency syndrome okay. and HTLV3 okay. LAV. And, and, and the confidence that, that, that the product is likely to be free of that particular of, of HIV risk, yes. Um, and would you also accept, looking at this material, th there's nothing which would inform a reader of, of what, um, I, I think you, you, you yourself have described and others have described as, as the almost inevitability of infection or transmission of non-A, non-B hepatitis, even with NHS products? N no, there's not. There's not an extended narrative on, on, on those risks, but I think as... as, as uh, uh, we, we may come on to discuss the purpose of these. Um, the per these were prescription-only medicines. Um, the labelling, the leaflets, and so on, were primarily targeted at the um, at the prescribing doctor. And and, uh, and in a sense, they had a much um, closer working knowledge of, of risks of hepatitis, non-A, non-B, hepatitis B, and latterly HIV than than the manufacturer of the products. So um, none of this information would have been. Um, uh, a surprise to a treating doctor. Yes, I, I may come back to that, um, um, Dr. Perry, but, but before I do that, just to complete the factual picture, um, the British Pharmacopoeia, and we have extracts only um, for present purposes um, at SBTS 000289. Um, so th these are uh, extracts provided by um, by SNBTS, and, and we, um, uh, uh, we will obviously want, want to look uh, at the uh, fuller pharmacopoeia in due course, um, and we can see these extracts related to factor eight rather than factor nine. If we go to the, the, the next page, please, Sully. So this is the extract, and um, we're told at the top of the page it's from the British Pharmacopoeia for 1973. Um, and then if we look down the bottom of the page to the heading dried human anti-haemophilic fraction, um, th there's a description that I'm not, not going to read through. If we go to the next page, we look at the right-hand column, top half of the page, there's a heading labelling. And we can see what's written here is the label on the container states, now just pausing there, this isn't, therefore, is this right, um, prescribing what should be in the package insert or leaflet. This is concerned only with what should be on the container itself. Precisely, yes. Um, and then we can see um, this is what the, the pharmacopoeia is um, uh, contemplating, that the label will state the number of units contained in it, um, uh, equivalence to the anti-haemophilic activity of normal plasma, um, amounts of fibrinogen, sodium ions, citrate ions, other added substances. 0.5 is about reconstitution, as is 0.6, 7, uh, 8. And then 0.9 is the number of donations in the pool from which the preparation was obtained. So that's... Um, and then 10, 11, 12 is about um, e expiry, um, uh, storage and use. So... It would appear from the British Pharmacopoeia extract 1973 that we've got here, there isn't any express reference to hepatitis there, but there is a requirement or a recommendation or an expectation um, that the label will state the number of donations in the pool. 
Yes, clearly. Yeah. Um, if we... that, I think that subsequently disappeared yes, in, in, absolutely in subsequent right. monographs. Yes, yes that, that, that is correct as far as I understand at least these extracts, and that's why I wanted to go through them with you with some care. If we go over the page... Um, you'll see someone's written at the top there, British Pharmacopoeia, 1973, Addendum, 1977. Um, uh, there's nothing of particular significance um, in uh, the passage in the addendum relating to anti-haemophilic uh, fraction. It's the one, one paragraph on the page that hasn't been crossed through. Um, and then if we go to the next page... Um, someone's written at the top there, British Pharmacopoeia, 1973, Addendum 1978, pages 11 to 12. Now, but just before we look at the text, I, I don't know whether you can assist with this, Dr, Dr. Perry, but um, is this right? There was a principal version of the Pharmacopoeia produced periodically, and then there would be... Was it every year that there was an addendum produced? Or? I... I, I... I can't confirm whether or not that's the case, um, but that was certainly uh, the way they managed changes in, in pharmaceutical development. If there was a, uh, um, because the pharmacopoeia is, if you've ever seen these things, they're, they're enormous yes. volumes and, uh, and, and republishing to make minor changes to certain monographs would, wouldn't be, um, it just simply wouldn't be possible. Well, it would be possible, but at an enormous cost and inconvenience to everybody, I think. So the, the system was that they would put out regular updates in the form of addenda, which were formal documents. And yes. Um, and um, then we can see, so this is um, uh, recorded as being the addendum from 1978. And if, if we go to the bottom right-hand um, part of the page then, under the heading Dried Human Antihemophilic Fraction... We can see um, th there is a, a narrative here which refers to um, donor selection and donor screening in relation to hepatitis B. Um, so it says blood to be used for preparing the fraction is obtained from human subjects A, who are, as far as can be ascertained by a registered medical practitioner after simple clinical examination and consideration of their medical history, free from disease transmissible by blood transfusion. B then refers to testing for syphilis. C then refers to testing for hepatitis B antigen. Um, uh, and then I don't think I need to read um, any of the remainder. And then if we go over the page... Um, and we look at the bottom right-hand part of the page, we've got the heading labelling. Thank you, Sally. Um, so here we've got... Um, uh, what's um, recommended for inclusion on the label. One, number of units. Two, um, concerns concentration of protein, sodium ions, citrate ions. Three, any other substances contained in it. Um, four, five, six, and seven are concerned with matters relating to reconstitution of the product. And then eight, that the preparation is of human origin and cannot be assumed to be free of hepatitis virus. So that's the language which is similar to the language used on the PFC labels, is that right? That's correct, yes. Um, and then nine is date, 10 and 11 concerns um, uh, storage and, and use. And, and so it would appear from this that between 1973 and 1978, the, um, uh, or, or sorry, by 1978, the British Pharmacopoeia recommendation that the label includes a, a description of the number of donations has disappeared. It has, and uh, and and they've added if um, yes. they've added hepatitis yes. risks. Yeah. Yes. I um, mean, in, in the terms that we see here, um, if, if we go to the next page, someone's written at the top, British Pharmacopoeia, nineteen eighty. Now, the inquiry will be checking this for itself, and we hope uh, to obtain full copies of the relevant pharmacopoeias. Um, but this would tend to suggest that in 1980, a, 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 new, a whole new pharmacopoeia was issued. So we had the 1973 one, then we had addendums being published, and then in 1980, there's a new version. Yes, that... Um, and we can see bottom of the page refers to the dried uh, factor 8 fraction. Um, if we go over the page to labelling... 
top left-hand uh, corner of the page. Uh, I, I don't, I think, need to read through all of them. Again, um, it, it echoes what we saw from the previous addendum from 1978. So there's no um, reference to number of donations. Uh, and then point eight is the terminology of the preparation is of human origin and cannot be assumed to be free of hepatitis virus. Um, now, that's, so that's 1980. Um, if we go to the next page... Someone's written on the top there, addendum, so British Pharmacopeia 1980, addendum 1986. Um, do, do you know, Dr Perry, bear in mind that this was provided by SNBTS, um, whether there were any um, addendum issued between 1980 and 1986 that related to factor eight concentrate? I don't know. I, well, again, sir, the inquiry um, will be endeavouring to um, uh, check all of the originals and find out for ourselves. Um, bottom right-hand corner, in any event, we see the start of the monograph for dried factor 8 fraction. And if we go over the page... Actually, no, can I... Sorry, Sally, if we stay on the page that we were... Um, look at the bottom right-hand corner. It says, dried factor 8 fractions prepared from human plasma are obtained from blood from more than 10 healthy donors who must, as far as can be ascertained after clinical examination, laboratory tests on their blood and a study of their medical history, be free from disease transmissible by transfusion of blood or blood derivatives. Um, uh, and then there's reference to how it's uh, prepared and so on. And then if we go back to the whole page, Sally, labelling's bottom right-hand corner of the page... Um, so here we have, as at 1986, the label on the container and the label on the package state. Um, and then I think I can skip over the first um, uh, few. Um, well, in fact, no, actually, I, I won't. Label on the container and label on the package state. And then there are a number of units, protein, heparin, um, information about preparation. And then the second paragraph says the label on the container or a leaflet accompanying the package states. And then we have the reference at three to the preparation cannot be assumed free of hepatitis virus. So it doesn't appear as at the addendum of 1986, at least from these extracts, that there's any reference in the British Pharmacopeia to HTLV3 or AIDS. No, I don't. There is no reference to AIDS at this stage. This is 1983. This is 1986. Oh, 1986. Okay. Um, no, there is no reference by that time. Um, and then the next extract we have is from 1988, which is the next page. Um, uh, we'll see in the description on, in the first paragraph on the left-hand side, we just go closer into that, please. Um, so again, it's reference to preparation from human plasma. Um, uh, uh, and then it says, the examinations and tests to be carried out are decided by the appropriate national authority, in particular tests for hepatitis B surface antigen and for HIV antibodies carried out by suitably sensitive methods and give negative results in both cases. Um, and then, if we go over the page, please, to the labelling. So if we can just zoom in on the paragraph on the left-hand side, please, Sally. Labelling, top of the page. Thank you. So we can see um, what's stipulated there for the label, number of units, concentration of protein, fibrinogen, heparin, other substances, volume of water... Uh, expiry dates, conditions for storage, um, and so on. Um, so there's no reference here to the label um, stating anything about infection. No, no. Um, do you know why that might have been the case as at 1988? Does, does that, is that reflecting the, the belief that products, the factor eight concentrates, had been successfully well, inactivated? I, I, 
I think so. I, I would, I'd make the general observation that pharmacopoeia monographs always tended to be um, produced um, after a, a significant period of time. You know, they, they weren't prospective. They were retrospective documents reflecting best practice and, uh, and, and, and developments and so on. Um, my, my explanation, I think, is not dissimilar to yours, that it was by that time there was an expectation that, that uh, uh, clotting factor products should not transmit HTLV3 or HIV as it was then. Or non A non B or non A, as or, non, a or, or perhaps non A non B, but I think it's a little early for that. So it's a, it is interesting that there is no reference to hepatitis virus because there were products still transmitting um, non A non B hepatitis at that time. Um, Dr. Perry, do, do you know from your own knowledge anything about how the British Pharmacopoeia in the 19th 1970s and 1980s was compiled, or, or, or who by? Well, I did actually sit for a brief period, or a, a, a few years, on the on the British Pharmacopoeia um, Commission subgroup on biologicals, and uh, and it met very infrequently and often by correspondence. And uh, and as I've described, it was a it was a highly retrospective ex exercise, um, and and. And, and prescribed absolute minimum standards. For instance, it, it talks about 10 donors, a minimum of 10 donors. Well, I, I know of no organization that produced factor eight from, from 10 donors, but it was, it was a document and a, and a system that was widely used beyond the UK. So it was targeted as well as uh, at um, developed countries, at developing countries as well. So it could give them some guidance on, 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 on how to make these products. It, it, um, on that point, it was plainly, if we just go back to the, the start of this, um, this particular label, uh, this particular document. Thank you. Um, next, previous page. Um, uh, and it's the first paragraph. The examinations, about halfway down, the examinations and tests to be carried out are decided by the appropriate national authority. So it looks from that that this was designed to deal with any uh, factor eight fraction, whether it was of origin at the PFC or BPL, but also origin elsewhere. Or any other country. Which yes. was being sold or distributed in the UK through, through pharmacies or, or, um, in, uh, or through hospitals. Um, and that might might explain or fit with the reference to 10 that you're mentioning, possibly. Yeah, absolutely. I, I, I recall being um, involved in discussions on, on some monographs, and, um, well, it, it was more than a tendency, it was a requirement um, uh, to provide the... It, it, it provided a minimum specification for these products. Um, um, it, 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 wasn't, it wasn't designed to be a state-of-the-art document. It was, it was designed, as I say, um, um, for other countries, and many other countries did use um, the British Pharmacopoeia as a reference document or a reference specification for, for products that they wished to make, not, not only plasma products, but many other pharmaceuticals as well. Um, so it, it was a, I think it was an attempt to provide a useful um, body of knowledge um, uh, for, for, for organizations that um, uh, wish to produce products but, but uh, for whatever reason couldn't, were not able to provide state-of-the-art pharmaceuticals, as it were. Just what, one, one further, um, slightly different point in respect of these labels. If we go to the very end uh, of this document, so the next page, please, Sally. Um, the, the very last words, which are not apparently to be put on the label as, or not prescribed as minimum for the label, um, are repeated from edition to edition, dried factor eight faction, which is what this is, after constitution should be administered only with equipment that includes a filter. Yes. Um, so it's not simply a question of reconstituting and putting into a syringe. There has to be a filter somewhere in the system. Yeah, the, 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 I think the, the conventional practice, as I understand it, and, 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 and we introduce this in our products latterly, um, that the, 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 the product 
and the insert leaflet um, would, and, and, and the outer package would contain a filter needle. So you would, you would, you would take the, you would aspirate the, the, the reconstituted product into the syringe, you would, um, um, and then attach a filter needle prior to infusion. I see. So that, that's how it would work. It wasn't a, it wasn't a, a, a big, sophisticated, um, filtered giving set. It was a, a simple filter needle that, that took out any, um, any particulate matter that might be there. Uh, and that would be why it didn't need to be put on the, the label, is it? Yes. Yes. Um, and, and as you've explained, Dr. Perry, th these effectively then were were minimum um, expectations. Um, so there was nothing that would prevent uh, um, someone producing Factor Eight, whether it's PFC or BPL or, or, or a commercial pharmaceutical company, from um, setting out more information, particularly in the package inserts and, le and leaflets. No, that, that's right. I think that's, that's absolutely right. Um, can I then just look at um, some of the evidence you've given on this topic um, to the Penrose inquiry? Um, when you were asked to, to explain um, PFC's approach. If we start with PRSE 0002620, this is a statement provided um, by um, you, um, I don't think it's, oh yes, it's, sorry, it's, it's um, in, in, at the end of 2011. If we go to the second page, Um, I just want to pick it up. Uh, so you've, you've set out an, an extract from a range of the, the materials. We've, we've looked at the original, so I don't need to trouble you with that. Uh, and then you say this, the above statements were designed to comply with regulatory and pharmacopoeial standards and to provide a warning to expert and experienced prescribers of the product, i.e. haemophilia doctors, of the generally recognised and understood infectivity risks associated with the use of these products. It was reasonable to assume that these expert users would understand that these risks included non A, non B hepatitis. Explanation of such risks to patients was exclusively the responsibility of haemophilia doctors. Notwithstanding that some patients, e.g. patients on home treatment, would, would have cited the information provided by the manufacturer this was not the target audience for the technical information which was required to be included. And then you refer, and I think you gave evidence on this yesterday afternoon, to um, um, the 19, a change in the 1990s when there was a specific requirement for patient information hmm. leaflets. Um, sorry, I think in fairness I should also read the, the third paragraph. Examples of leaflets held by SMBTS from other manufacturers suggest that the statements included with PFC products were typical of products at that time. Um, I just wanted to go back to the first of those paragraphs that I read, Dr. Perry. Um, so the paragraph beginning, the above statements were designed. So can we just have that? Thank you, Sully. Uh, so as I understand it, the explanation that you're giving here, Dr. Perry, is that um, it, 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 it was reasonable not to have an express reference to non-A, non-B hepatitis um, uh, uh, because haemophilia clinicians would have that knowledge themselves? I, I, I think that, that that was the prevailing view, yes. Um, the, in fact, the products that, that PFC made only only went to five individual centres in Scott Factor 8 products to, to, to five individual centres, and, uh, and, and, and haemophilia doctors are, are you know, much more knowledgeable about the risks of coagulation factors with respect to non-A, non-B hepatitis. And, and it was certainly the case that um, the, the belief, and that's not just my belief, that was the belief of, 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 of RTC medical colleagues and so on, that conveying and, 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 and providing a, a detailed narrative an understanding of the risks associated with products was not, not the responsibility of the manufacturer, it was the responsibility of the prescribing doctor. On, on that basis, why say anything about hepatitis at all? Haemophilic clinicians would be even more familiar perhaps with hepatitis B. Uh, because that's what the regulation and the, and the, and the reference um, uh, documents required us to do. D did did um, PFC, as far as you know, ever actually discuss with haemophilia clinicians using its products, A, 
what their knowledge of non A, non B hepatitis was, because they're haematologists rather than virologists or hepatologists, or, or discuss with them what information they were providing about non A, non B hepatitis to their patients? Um, no, I think, um, if, if anything, the flow of information was in the other direction. They would inform us on, on risks of, of hepatitis in their patients um, or incidents of, of transmissions and, uh, and so on. But um, to, the, to the best of my recollection, um, we, we would periodically, um, including myself, Dr. Foster, others, Professor Cash, we would give talks, lectures, presentations on, on, on products and refer um, to, to matters such as hepatitis, but um, I, d I don't think it was an ever, um, ever, a, ever a view that um, that, the, that the SMBTS um, was an expert on non-A, non-B hepatitis. And uh, I know, as you say, um, hemophilia doctors are uh, um, hematologists by trade, um, but they they do have and and, and increasingly had. Uh, an expert knowledge on, on hepatitis and its transmission and its implications for patients. What, did, is it right to put it this way, that the PFC, um, in taking its decisions about what it included on, on leaflets and so on, um, acted on an assumption that information about non-A, non-B hepatitis was being provided to patients by clinicians? without any actual knowledge itself that that was taking place? Oh, well, I, I, I think it's more than an assumption. I think, I, I think it was a, um, a, a, an evidence-based belief that, that, that they, knew, um, they knew the risks of treatment with, with these products. They talked to us about it. They, they, they delivered publications. They, they studied groups of patients and, uh, and so on. But the, the they you're talking about there are the haemophilia clinicians. I'm talking about haemophilia clinicians, yes. In, 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 uh, my, my question was slightly different, forgive me. It, it, no, 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 the fault's mine. Um, it's, did PFC essentially assume that, that PFC as the product manufacturer did not need to spell out risks relating to non-A, non-B hepatitis? because PFC assumed that clinicians would be spelling out those risks to their patients. I, I, I think clinicians, um, as, as, as I understand it, would be trained in the requirement to have a, a, a sufficient knowledge of the risks associated with treatment so that they can convey that to patients. Um, and like all other manufacturers, um, we were quite limited in the amount of information that it was appropriate. Um, to, to, to give to doctors or, and certainly to patients. So I think your assumption is, it, it, is, an, it is an assumption, um, but it's, it's one based on, on, on a good knowledge of the people that we were working with and providing the products to. Looking at it now, and with the knowledge that, certainly by a, by a date in the early 1980s, um, you, you referred yesterday to, I think, the Cone of publication. It may have been the Fletcher publication that you had in mind, but in any event, a publication in 1983, which suggested a high risk of infectivity with non-A, non-B hepatitis from NHS concentrates, yes. and not just commercial concentrates. So looking at knowing that as at 1983, if not earlier, um, do you think PFC... Rather than saying this product can't be assumed to be free of hepatitis viruses, that rather understated the risk, and that there was a case for saying this product is likely to transmit hepatitis virus, because that, that was the state of knowledge, at least by 1983, wasn't it? Um, I think by 1983 there was increasing knowledge that, 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 that the NHS products and commercial products did transmit non-A, non-B hepatitis in, in close to 100% of recipients over a period of time. Um, but, but the information um, th that, that we gained, or that our knowledge, actually, for instance, from the, that key publication from, uh, from Peter Kernoff, um, he was a member of the UK HCDO. These were, these were topics that routinely uh, and regularly were discussed by haemophilia doctors. So in a sense, we got that information from from publications provided by experts dealing with haemophilia patients. And um, I, I think, to be honest, we, we, we didn't feel the need, certainly at PFC, to um, uh, 
elaborate on, on that information, they, we would just be reflecting back to them the information that they provided to us. But look, looking at it now, and I, I ask this question because this may be a submission made in due course to the chair, and it'll be a matter for the chair, obviously, to decide. Looking at it now, do you think PFC made the wrong call in not stating sufficiently clearly the risks of non-A, non-B hepatitis on its project information? No, I don't. I, I, I think PF, PFC reflected the wider practice through the industry. Um, we had we had many. We used to have discussions with haemophilia directors on a on a on a, on a frequent basis, and there was there was a, a, a legitimate concern that we should neither under exaggerate or over exaggerate the risks associated with the product. So the wording that was used was 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 not just the wording that PFC um, um, uh, developed. It was informed by. Our medical advisors, Professor Cash, RTC colleagues, haemophilia doctors, and so on, plus plus um, satisfying the, the the requirements of the regulatory authorities. And it and it may well have been if we'd have been more explicit in saying we we want now to say that this product will transmit non A non B hepatitis. It, it could well have been that the regulatory authorities say no, you 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 can't say that. They, they might they might say it is not absolutely proven, so you cannot state something that's not absolutely um, proven scientifically and, and enjoys a, 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 a large consensus. That, that I think is, and I, I don't mean this as a criticism, but that's I think that's a, a degree of speculation on your part, absolutely. because as I understand it, that conversation never took place. PFC didn't ask the licensing authorities for its view on... Um, whether there should be a, any explicit statement about either non-A, non-B hepatitis or about the likelihood of infection with non-A, non-B hepatitis. No, that's right. That's right. I, I, I do remember, and I think, I think this has been raised somewhere in, in, in the evidence that's provided to the inquiry, perhaps by Dr. Foster, that he recalls a, a conversation either with Professor Cash or, or Dr. Ludlam where we, we did suggest that we should be much more explicit about the risk of HIV in our products and my understanding is that, that, that Professor Ludlam and his colleagues um, expressed concern at, 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 at making such a statement, not, not that they wanted to hide it, but, but he felt the wording had to be very, very carefully considered. Yes, well, I'll, I'll check that. I, I think there certainly is a reference to a conversation with Professor Cash yes. um, in, in the evidence somewhere. Whether it referenced Dr Ludlam or not, I'll, I'll, we'll check. I, I'm, I'm not sure whether there's any documented evidence of this, um, of this conversation. Uh, um, can I, that leads then to the question of, 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 of warnings about AIDS or HTLB3. Um, if, if we can perhaps just... Um, look at PRSC 0001885. Um, no, in fact, I don't need to because you're, you were just summarising in that document what wasn't in the leaflets about, and we've, we've looked at the leaflets yes. themselves. Um, so can I then um, take you to some of your evidence to the Penrose inquiry on the issue of warnings in relation to uh, AIDS. PRSC 0006038, please. Uh, so this is your evidence on the 24th of June, 2011. Sally, can we go to page 98, please? Um, so you were asked at line four this question. I just wanted to ask you whether consideration had been given within PFC to include in the text information about the risks of AIDS or HIV from the products at any stage in 1983 or 1984. Um, and your answer is no, and then you go on to, to, to explain why that might have been the case. C can I just ask you to confirm that that's correct? I think you say it elsewhere in the evidence as well. Oh, you say it elsewhere in your evidence to Penrose. That you, you don't recall there being any express discussion within PFC of the issue of, of adding information about AIDS risks 
uh, in 83 or 84? No, other than that which we just mentioned about the, the possible conversation with Professor Cash and his proposal to, to first love them. So uh, I think the views expressed in that answer during the Penrose inquiry, I would still, I, I still think are, are, are my views today. And if we just read then what you um, gave us as, as the reasoning there, um, you say, I think at that stage, with the state of scientific knowledge, it would have been highly improper for any manufacturer of a pharmaceutical product without good reason and without good evidence that the product may present a risk of HIV. The sort of information that's provided in these package insert leaflets is highly controlled and highly regulated. And I think in the absence of any information, the control authorities would have taken grave exception to us intimating without any evidence on that this was the case. Uh, sorry, can we just go further down the page, Sonny? I'm not suggesting that there was no evidence. I know there was a body of evidence growing and so on, but not to the extent that allowed one to place this as a standard warning in a pharmaceutical product. Um, now, again, is it right to understand that, that um, there was no conversation um, with the regulatory authorities about this in, in 83, 84? Um, not that, not that I was aware of. It, it may have been discussed. I don't know. Um, on the uh, biological committee of the of the committee on safety of medicines, which Mr. Watt was a member of at that time in 1983 and 1984, but I I, I don't remember personally having any um, direct conversation with the regulatory authorities uh, about these issues. And 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 indeed, I think I think my 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 speculation there. On, on what the, the regulatory authorities might have thought, I think is is, is still valid. At, at in, certainly in 1983 and 1984, we were aware of HIV um, and, and its risks, but at that stage, there was no evidence that our products were transmitting um, at that stage. Um, and therefore, to put in a leaflet that this product may transmit, I think the regulatory authorities would have come back and asked for evidence of that. And, and at that stage, there was no evidence. So th this sounds very pedantic, but that's, this, is, this is how the regulatory authorities work. Um, they're very careful and very clear on, on what can and should be communicated to patients and, and the manner in which it is communicated. Now, it, it, maybe I hope that we'll hear evidence from, or, or, or hear or receive evidence from regulatory authorities in due course in relation to what their approach was at the time. Sure. Yeah. Um, but, but is this right then? Your, your evidence your, is that you think that if a pharmaceutical manufacturer went to the regulatory authorities in, in the United Kingdom in, in the 1980s and said, um, we think it's likely that HTLV, that, or that AIDS is transmissible through factor concentrates, because that was certainly by 1984, sure. the belief. Sure. It was, I think, the belief probably pretty early on in 1983. Yes. Not proven, but, but the yes. belief. And we'd like to say something about that in our, not necessarily on the label, but in our leaflets. Mm -hmm. You think the regulatory authorities would turn to a pharmaceutical company and say, no, you can't say that? I, I, I think they'd want to see the evidence for the statement that you're making. And in the same way that pharmaceutical companies in the documentation that they provide, the insert leaflets and so on, um, they are certainly not permitted to make claims for benefits that without evidence. And I think the converse of that is true as well, that they, they shouldn't be um, 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 pronouncing risks where, where a sufficient body of evidence doesn't exist. Now, I, 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 it, it, that, that might sound a little complacent by the, by the system, but, but that's, that's my understanding of how it worked. Well, as I say, it may be that we'll have to try and pick sure. that up with, with, with um, um, evidence in relation to the approach of the licensing authorities. Can I then, just continuing with um, evidence on this theme to um, the Penrose inquiry, if we go to PRSC 0001324, please. Um, now, this is um, another written statement to the Penrose Inquiry from you. If we go over to the bottom of the page, 
Um, sorry, bottom of the next page. My apologies. Um, sorry. You were asked by the PEMO's inquiry the, the question of what discussions there were amongst staff of the PSC of the possibility of including reference to risk of HIV transmission on package inserts. Your answer was there you can't recall whether or not in 82 and 83 you had any discussions with the PFC director, Mr Watt, containing the inclusion of AIDS warnings. And you don't know if Mr Watt discussed the possibility with others, including Dr Cash as national medical director. Now, that's obviously the period prior to you taking up the directorship. Sure. But you were, I think, as quality control inspector, um, liaison with regulatory authorities, con content of, of, of leaflets and so on, was part of your role. It was. It was. Um, and then if we go to the next page, um, you say this. However, I did lead a review of the packaging systems for Factor 8 and 9 products during this period, which resulted in the introduction of new multi-vial packaging. Product warnings on both product packaging and leaflets remained unchanged and continued to refer only to a hepatitis risk. Just pausing there, um, although we know there was no change in the product warnings, you say so there, and we've, look, we've looked at the underlying documents. What, what did the review that you described there entail? Well, it was, I think the review was a response to feedback that we were getting that the, the, the existing um, presentation of the product in individual boxes um, was, was not the most convenient, particularly for patients increasingly being, um, um, being um, uh, transferred onto home therapy. So we produced, a, as, a, as it's described there, a multi-vial. Um, it was a, 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 a small box with 10 vials of product and 10 vials of of water for reconstitution, product insert leaflets, and so on. Um, and, and, as a, and as part of that process, um, I, I, I think I also carried out a review of the, because it was a, an appropriate time to do it, because we were making a change to the packaging, um, to check that the, that the wording that was used, uh, particularly on the, on the outer box packaging and on the vial label, was, was still accurate and, and, and reflecting the, the current position. Um, and, then and, you... and, 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 and during that process, as, as I think I've described there, Mr. Watt was on the Committee on Safety of Medicines. He would have looked at these things um, on, on a number of occasions, and I, and I don't recall him um, suggesting that we needed to change the warnings, um, or, or indeed Professor Cash, because he would have also been involved in just checking the, uh, the documentation and the, and the and leaflets and the packaging and so on. Um, can I just pick up on the point you make about, about Mr. Watt by reference to his membership of the Biological Subcommittee? Mm. Of course, if that issue had been discussed uh, um, as part of the proceedings of the Biological Subcommittee, Mr. Watt wouldn't have been able to pass that on because those meetings were confidential. Mm. Uh, it, it's a very good point, but he, he, may have found, he may have found a way to communicate that this was an emerging view. And then if we continue... Um, in any event, you you no recollection that he uh, of him saying anything of the kind. No, no, he didn't. And then, if we continue with this paragraph, um, sorry, with this passage, you say I cannot recall whether or not in 1984, following my appointment as director, I discussed with others in PFC or elsewhere the possibility or desirability of modifying our warnings to include AIDS. I think it's possible that such discussions took place, e.g., with Dr. Cash, Dr. Bolton, and the haemophilia directors. And then this, I think, is the reference that you were you were making earlier, Dr. Perry. Yes. For example, yes. Dr. Foster's advised me that he recalls that in late 1983, the SMBTS, Professor Cash, suggested at a meeting between SMBTS and haemophilia directors the inclusion of an AIDS warning, but that this suggestion was rejected by those present in the belief that such action might cause patients unnecessary anxiety. However, the SMBTS has been unable to find any record of this. Um, and then if we just look at the next sentence, please, Sally. In any event, no action was taken to include any specific reference to AIDS or HIV until heat-treated defix was issued in September 1985. That's correct. Um, can we then and just go over the page and, and, and I just pick, get, go through this with you um, before we break? You say, however, I'm unable to find any reference to or evidence of a process which led any individuals to recommend in favour of or against the introduction of AIDS warnings for factor 8 products. 
Prior to 1985, product information supplied by PFCS and BTS reflected the background of knowledge and guidance available between 1982 and 1984, i.e. And then you've set out here a series of, of, of six points, and I just wanted to, in, in, in fairness to you, just um, go through those. Um, first is no requirement or advice from the UK licensing authority to include such warnings for products used in the UK. Now, we'll leave aside the, the, the British pharmacopoeia, sure. because we've already discussed those tended to be m minimum recommendations or stipulations, yes. Yes. and after the event, um, yes. rather than um, um, uh, being proactive. So you're talking here about the UK licensing authority, essentially the, the, the medicines division of the Department of, of Health. Is that really what you have in mind here? Uh, yes, the or, medicines control agency, yes. Yes, I'm not sure it was called that then, but in any event, it may have been. I think it was. Uh, you, you may okay. well be right. Um, but so you're talking about any event, something coming from the, the, the medicines division or from the, the Committee on the Safety of Medicines or the Biological Subcommittee, That's some, right. some manifestation of the, of the licensing yes. authorities. Um, other than through the, um, the, the process of submitting license applications and having them approved... Um, which would have involved, obviously, a degree of dialogue with the licensing authority, and we've seen you would submit your proposed um, draft leaflet package insert to, 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 to the licensing authority. So that was obviously one means whereby the licensing authority could give you its views. Yeah. But that would only happen at application or renewal time. Um, was, was there? Did the licensing authority... Um, issue advice or requirements other than during the license application process? If, 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 if there was a key development um, for, for any pharmaceutical that required them to provide an update or a, um, or a revision, or, uh, then, then they would have done that spontaneously. But they also, if, 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 if there had been an approach to the licensing authority, they would have responded um, if a, a, an approach by a manufacturer um, for instance, it, it wanted to change its leaflet or it wanted to change its, its packaging or it wanted to change uh, risk warnings, as you've discussed, then I think that there, there, there was a mechanism for, for dialogue between manufacturers and the licensing authority. But, but we know that no such approach was made by PFC. So um, my, my question was more really, did, did the licensing authority proactively issue advice on um, out, outside of... Um, and dialogue with an individual manufacturer. Generic guidance. Generic to the guidance industry. or advice in, uh, in the early 80s. I can't remember. Um, uh, it, it, if there was a, a particular risk arising from a particular drug, then it would have issued a warning, um, perhaps to um, all manufacturers um, to either keep an eye out for a, a particular new adverse event or, or if there was a requirement to change um, uh, the, the specification of a product as a result of clinical experience, then yes, they would, have, they would have put out warnings or notifications and so on. I can't remember the detail of how it happened, but it was, it was, I, I think there almost certainly was a formal system for maintaining an open dialogue between the regulatory authorities, the licensing authority, and the license holders. In any event, is this right? That there was neither an approach by PFC to, PFC to the licensing authority for advice, nor anything issued by the licensing authority to to, to PFC or anyone else, to your knowledge. I can't about remember. It. I can't remember any such approach. The, the second point you make in this um, um, part of your your paper. I would, I'm sorry. Yes. I, I, I would say that, that that Mr. Watt regularly attended meetings of the licensing authority as. Um, of, uh, on the biological subcommittee, and, and he had there would have been opportunity at those meetings for him to discuss these issues with um, the secretariat of the of the biological subcommittee. But uh, but it, I, I have no record of, of of him coming back and saying this this is a, a topic which has emerged in discussion. Do you mean informal opportunities? Informal opportunities, yes. Um, the, the second bullet point is this. In contrast to products imported from the USA and prior to October 84, there was no evidence that products manufactured from UK plasma had transmitted HTLV3. Um, now, I just wanted to explore with you whether that was, was 
whether you maintain that was a sufficient reason or a good reason not to include any warnings on PFC products. If you wait until a UK product has transmitted HGLV3, you're, isn't that rather too late? I, I understand the question. Um, um, but, uh, but again, um, in terms of the formal documentation that went out with our products, um, uh, as, I've, as I've said before, I think um, um, the, as, as far as the, the, the very formal and limited information that we provided with the products um, and, and, and the requirement to get regulatory approval for that, there, there would have been at least disquiet that we were issuing uh, a warning for which there was no evidence. Um, but but we, we, we didn't test that in, in practice. The next bullet point is prior to 1984, no consensus on the causal relationship between AIDS and treatment with coagulation factor products. That, that, is that essentially this, is that a different point to the point you've already made? Uh, no, I think it's slightly different. I, I think it's an arguable statement. I would, I would um, um, acknowledge. Um, um, I think many would say that there was there, wa there was consensus on the causal relationship. But there are others. There were there were legitimate uh, scientists and and, and and experts expressing slightly different views at that time. But do, do you need a consensus in order to be able to include a warning if you, as the manufacturer, believe that the risk is real? Well, the only way the manufacturer knows whether the risk is real is, is by talking to the, uh, the, the people that prescribe the products, because that's where the information comes back from. Um, and, and so in, in terms of its, 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 its routine scanning of the environment in which it operates, it, it, it can only get the information that it needs to, to make statements from, from, the, um, from the, the, the people that are using the products and, and the publications that they make. So. Um, I'm not sure whether that answers the question. Uh, um, well, that may be a matter for the, for the, for the chair. Um, th but that leads to the next point, which is you say um, PFCS and BTS received no request or advice from haemophilia directors to include such warnings. So just pausing there, I, think it, that I certainly think we've seen no evidence of that, of, of, of that so you may be right. Um, but you then say this, it's highly unlikely that PFC would have included AIDS warnings without their express agreement and support. That's right. Why, why was the agreement and support of the treating clinicians a prerequisite to putting information on a product? Because they, they um, I, 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 I think there was a, a, an understandable sensitivity um, in this area, well, it was a, it was a, it was an extraordinarily difficult um, period of time in which everyone operated, um, and I think we we may well have discussed with haemophilia doctors whether we wanted to, whether we should put more explicit warnings, and and I think the feedback that we got um, was um, that we that we that their preference would be to, would was to be cautious. I think, I, th I think certainly our view and 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 Professor Cash's view would have been that. Um, it's it's no business of 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 the, of the manufacturer and the supplier um, to um, provide such direct warnings. Those sort of uh, nuanced discussions, which which are not absolutely clear, was the business of the haemophilia, the, uh, the doctor that's treating the patients, and, and our job was to provide as much information to the prescribing doctor, and it's then for the doctor to prescribe what what is what is. Uh, what is known and what is best communicated and not communicated to individual patients. And that was, that was a clear view. Can you help me with this, particularly the reference that you just made to what Professor Cash may have thought? Um, a, a few minutes ago, we were talking about Professor Cash uh, having had a conversation in which he was suggesting that there might be a warning in respect of AIDS to SMBTS and, and uh, uh, clinicians who were persuading him that he shouldn't do so, not because there were no risk, uh, or because a warning might not in itself be justified, but because it might cause unnecessary distress or, or anxiety amongst the patients who might be receiving it. Yes. So how does that fit with, um, with what you're saying here? Um. And if, if I understand the, the, the question correctly, um, I, I think 
I, 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 think, I think what I'm saying here is that um, th this, is, this is an example of, of, of the, cle the clear demarcation which existed between um, the SMBTS and, and, the pres and, the, and those that prescribed our products. And, uh, and, and Professor Cash was always um, emphasizing the importance of not, um, um, of, of not, of, of the SMBTS as a manufacturer, uh, not, not trying to influence product use and, 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 and so on. So uh, I, I, I'm not sure I'm answering your question, sir, but um, it, the, the emphasis for the PFC and for the wider SMBTS through its medical colleagues, Dr. Bolton and Professor Cash and, uh, and others, was to provide the best possible information we could to the haemophilia um, directors. It was a um, one, one of the advantages uh, of, of, of the SMBTS system of manufacture and supply is that it, it was a very collegiate uh, group of people involving um, regional transfusion centres, PFC as the, as the operational manufacturing unit, and, and haemophilia doctors. And I think many of these um, discussions about um, development, certainly in the, in the early and mid-80s during the um, during the, uh, up, leading up to and, and, and during this, 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 these terrible events uh, were always conducted collegiately. So there will be an instinctive um, um, tendency in SMBTS to, to consult with um, haemophilia doctors so that they could judge whether if, if, if the manufacturer um, put out a warning, a, a formal warning on a, on a, on a particular product, uh, whether the haemophilia directors um, would be able to support that or, or whether that would be consistent with the information they wanted to give to their patients. Um, the, the, the reference to um, a concern about causing distress or anxiety, uh, about there being a lot of sensitivity about this issue, I think is picked up in the next bullet point where you say um, the, need, the need to be some measure of evidence a genuine risk assist, existed be inappropriate for a manufacturer to provide warnings which could cause anxiety and alarm to patients and which might cause patients to reject life-saving treatment. Um, would, would it be right to understand the evidence that you've given over the, over the last few minutes and what we see reflected here as, as um, indicating that the message that was coming back to PFC or SNBTS from the haemophilia clinicians in Scotland was was a message of we don't want patients to be alarmed. We don't want patients to be caused anxiety. We don't want patients to be put off from um, accepting factor concentrates. I, 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 don't, I, I don't think I can, I can say that that was, that was their position. I don't, I, I, no, it's the PF, what, was that the PFC's the PFC, perception? The PFC's perception was that, that it, was our, it was our job and our duty to consult with haemophilia directors, which we did on a whole range of issues, and, and, and this was one of them, and we would accept um, the, the advice and the feedback that we got, unless it contravened a particular regulatory requirement. Um, and there are there are other. This, I, I don't think this was just a, a feature of, of, of SMBTS or or Scotland. There are a, a number of examples throughout the world where um, there was a late reference um, to HTLV3 and AIDS in, in package inserts. And the, and and the most striking example that I've seen recently, or or uh, certainly reminded myself about recently, was the the products that were supplied to Canada. Um, where um, commercial manufacturers in, in, in the, and they, they obtain their supplies of product from commercial suppliers um, fr from the US. And I, I think at, at, at some stage, the, the, the commercial products did include um, perhaps AIDS warnings, but the Canadian um, authorities who were supplying plasma for fractionation on a contract basis to America said, we don't want to include that warning. Now, I'm not saying that's the right Outcome, but it's another example of this um, of this of this difficult area of of what the manufacturer should should say um, to the to, to the user of its products. It, it might be said, Dr. Perry, that if if the feeling that is coming from the haemophilia centre directors is we don't want to cause undue anxiety to our patients by having some reference to AIDS on the products, that that should be ringing alarm bells for SMBTS and PFC 
that information about AIDS is not being passed on in practice to patients, which might reinforce the importance of you as a manufacturer setting it out when you release your product because you can't have the confidence that the clinicians are, are actually um, in, in their real life discussions with patients providing that information. Well, yes, and as I've, as I've described, the outcome isn't as you've suggested it might have been, um, but, but there was no absence of discussion, um, and there, there were certainly alarm bells ringing um, uh, throughout this period. They were very loud and they were very persistent. Um, um, but I can, I can only repeat what I've said, that we did, we, 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 we consulted on this, we, we asked for their views and the feedback. Uh, uh, perhaps it's an issue that haemophilia Haemophilia doctors need to, to respond on how, how how they were managing that important interface with their patients. They, they, they certainly have and been I'm asked sure, the, sure the, those have. questions, Dr. Perry. Just just the last then question on on, on on this point. I'm conscious we've got, got into a time that would normally be for, for for a break. It might be said that there's something profoundly paternalistic about a system um, which. Uh, says we're, we're not going to include information about a, um, a potential risk of a fatal virus um, because we don't want to cause alarm and anxiety. D do you have any comment on that? Well, only, uh, you know, I'm, I'm not a medical doctor. I'd, uh, I had no direct dealings with patients in terms of their treatment. Um, and, and I think um, by today's standards, it, it was, as you describe it, it was a much more paternalistic um, uh, system and 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 the actions and inactions at that time um, were quite different to, to those that you would expect today. I'm 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 not I'm not sure if a if a um, um, God forbid a, another virus should enter the the blood supply that there wouldn't be similar considerations about how sure we are we of this. Do we know what the clinical outcome of this is? Do we know what the long term sequelae is to, to the infections with this product, they are always difficult decisions. And, uh, um, I, and I think in that environment, the PFC as a, as a, as a manufacturer of the, of, of the products put out the best information that it thought it was justified in, in doing. Um, so th th that completes my questioning on this topic. And I'm conscious I've gone 15 minutes over into what would normally be everybody's break. So perhaps we could take the break now. Yeah, yes, well, it was, it was uh, just quite right that you should do so. Um, we'll take a break uh, now until 12 o'clock, 12 o'clock. <laughs>